welcome friends for this monthly meeting i'm very glad to come and join you in this meeting uh, somebody sent me by email the other day a quote a quotation from raman maharishi he said that god and guru and the self are the same then he explains that when we are human beings we do not realize that god is our self we worship god as somebody sitting somewhere else up in the heavens so god is separate from us to start with when our worship matures that's what he says when our worship and prayer to god matures a guru in human form appears he is the same god in human form god has now become guru this guru if he is perfect he pushes you to go within your own self and when you realize yourself you discover that you are also that guru and you are also god there is no difference between the three but just because our way of living here our assumptions in life here we are separating them there is actually no separation at all so when we discover our true self we have discovered god there is no difference at all and the self is sitting inside us can you imagine that we are sitting in a human body and god is sitting inside us and it is no different than our master no different than our own self it's all one but we have divided in order to have an experience of many experience of time and space experience of vastness that is why we have employed a very small computer computer like machine called the human mind the human mind functions to separate it designed to separate so that the same single oneness can be separated and made into many and that is why the different levels of creation within the mind have so much time and space so much light and sound they have all these things separated because we want to have a different experience our true nature which is the true nature of god is consciousness in which there are some built in qualities consciousness does not sit by itself it has some built in qualities first quality is it can be conscious of anything it wants to which means it's a creative power if consciousness becomes conscious of something that becomes creation and that is how the whole creation has taken place from consciousness and consciousness has some built in things into it which have never been separated and those are love beauty and intuition intuitive knowledge that means total knowledge is already there in consciousness which expresses itself when we are separated as our own intuitive feeling intuitive knowledge similarly when we experience love here it is the nature of consciousness to have that quality of love and we experience it here similarly when we appreciate beauty here and we feel it's great and we can't even explain it why we think something is beautiful it is the nature of consciousness so this natural ability to have these experiences at all times no matter how deep the creation has gone these things can be experienced at all levels of creation which means all level of consciousness so that is why it's a very good quote that i received and i was very happy that somebody is reading things which represent the ultimate truth namely that god and guru and the self are the same when do we discover it when we discover the self before that when do we discover that guru is god when we go right to inside our own meditative state and we discover that the guru is actually the god who has appeared in human form it's a very strange rare experience great master used to explain this in the form of a little story he used to say that there was once upon a time which is of course the beginning of every story once upon a time there was a very benevolent king and the king was so concerned about his 
subjects that he would occasionally disguise himself like an ordinary person and go about his kingdom looking at how people are living. One day this king went into a forest and saw a poor man breaking the tree into logs, carrying the logs on his back into town and making a small living out of that. He felt sorry for him. He said, look how hard he's working and how little he's getting for it. So he told that man in the forest, look, can I help you in some way? He said, sorry, you are just an outsider who have come here and I am used to this work. You can't help me. The king in disguise said, no, I can also cut trees. You Do you know? And he began to cut the trees along with that other guy. And he told the king, one day you will learn plenty because you will also become an expert in cutting logs from trees. And the king also, along with this man, would bring the logs into town and sell them. Then one day the king told this man, you know, I know the guard at the palace of the king. And if you want to see what is inside the palace, I can take you. The guard will be able to let us in. He said, don't talk nonsense because nobody can go inside that palace. The guards are very strong. They don't let any strangers go in. He said, if you give me the chance, I'll try. But he had to take some time to persuade the man in the forest to go to the palace. When they went to the palace, the king gave a sign to the guard and the, not to treat him like a king, and which he had told him earlier also when he used to leave out. And the guard, he said to the guard, you are my old friend. Can we just have a peep inside the palace? He said, all right. This man was so impressed. He says, you are so big that you know these guards and you are still working with me in the forest logging trees. Any day, he was very happy to have a glimpse of the palace. He says, huge place, wonderful place. The king must be having a good time there. He said, we don't know what the king's life is like. So he went back to the forest. He tried to persuade him that, look, the guard will even let us go in. So next time they came, the guard let them in. He said, do you know, I also know a minister in the cabinet. He can let us go and see the king even. So gradually he persuaded this man to go and see the king. So when they went inside, the, the minister said, king is very busy, but come again. So he said, it's very difficult to see the king. And they both came back. Eventually, he again persuaded him, let's go and try again. They went again to try. And the minister said, yes, king is in today. So they walked in, the throne was empty. So the man from the forest said, where is the king? And this man sat on the throne and said, I am the king. He said, why didn't you tell me first? He said, you were not even willing to believe that I know the God. How could I tell you I am the king? <laughs> this is our state. A perfect living master comes into, into our life. And we say, maybe he's a learned person. Maybe he has got something and can help us. Maybe he can make us win the lottery or, or something. Or maybe he can find a suitable life partner for us. Or maybe he can do other things. We think of the master like that. And when the master says, go within and find yourself, it's hard time to go. We still tell the master, no, you try to do it right for us. We can't do it. When we eventually succeed in going in and we find the master, he says, you are so strong. You are so full of life. And we are going through different stages of consciousness, of different worlds. And the rulers of those worlds are respecting you. Why didn't you tell me first? He said, look, I am your friend. We are just on a journey. And when we reach our true home, Sachkhand, we find the same person whom we thought was just a master sitting as Satpurush as the creator of everything. There is no difference. The next step is we says, you are no different from me. You sit on the same throne and become one. This is a very interesting phase of the spiritual path. It's very hard for us to understand it here. We doubt everything. Our doubts are created because we are taking the created universe as our only reality. We think this is real. Rest is just trying to find something. Maybe it is there. Maybe it is more real. When people ask me, tell us something really true about the 
ultimate home, such hunt, what is it like? Do we have people there like us? I said, no, sorry. Do we have clubs like this? Do we have shops like this? No. Then what is the use of going there? Our whole idea of what is worthwhile going to is based upon our experience in this physical world. We don't even realize that we are going to a place where we belong, from where we have created everything. And we don't even know why we create it. We ask, I am a human being, what is the purpose of my life? What is the purpose of your life is that you created it for having a different experience. And one day you'll go back. No, that's not understandable. Explain to me better. Okay, explain is that you meditate a lot, work hard, go inside, you'll find the truth. That makes some sense. Although the first sentence was more true than the second one. But this is how we are so engrossed, so engrossed in a temporary experience. When I say temporary experience, some people don't take it seriously. They think it's a long enough experience. One physical life, long enough experience. We'll be here for years and years. When the last moment comes in this life, then we see how temporary it is. Because what makes us realize it is temporary is none of our relatives are going with us. Not even our beloveds, not even our sp spouses, not even our children, not our house, not our car. Nothing is going with us at all. And then we realize how could we treat all these things as real and belonging to us when nothing is going with us. We don't take things in life as if they are given to us for use. We don't treat things and people that come into our life that this is part of an experience, temporary experience. And there is a purpose behind that temporary experience. We don't take it like that. We try to make people and things our own. It belongs to me. And we keep on saying these things. This, I have a new house. It belongs to me. It's very nice. House will never go with us in a short time when we leave the body. These nice things we buy, we try to make them our own. We don't say these are great gifts given to our experience and let's enjoy them and go back home. The truth is, this world is like a big carnival. When we go to a carnival, there are those Ferris wheels going around, there are other wheels moving around, there are so many other rides available. We go and enjoy them. We don't think that we're going to take them home with us because when the show ends, we come back home. This is actually the situation here also. But here we try to make things our own, that they belong to us. They, nothing that is here belongs to us. What belongs to us is somewhere hidden inside us. That belongs to us. We belong there. That's inside us. But these things, outside things, we are trying to make them our own and they never become our own. When a person dies in this physical body, the last experience is he can look back on his entire life. We sometimes do that even while we are living. But at death, everybody goes through an experience of looking back at life which is now ending. We know the end has come, nothing is going with us, and we look back in reverse order, the thing that happened, and we regret so much. We could have done better. We could have helped some people better. We could have taken care of ourselves better. We could have had a different type of life. Sorry, too late. But that's what happens. If we could realize this thing while we are living, our life would be different. And we can realize exactly what we experience at the end of our life by dying while living, which is mainly the purpose of meditation over here. What is, why do we meditate? Why should we meditate? Is it just to get peace of mind and some calmness? Or does it have a deeper purpose? The deepest purpose of meditation here is that you can experience your death while you are still living. 
and therefore not only the fear of death goes away because you know it's not the end of yourself it's the end of the body but you also know that everything around is only temporary and will not go with you you can have that experience just through meditation that's a big thing to be able to understand death and to be able to understand what happens after death is a very useful experience for anybody and life changes right here because life is based upon how we look upon it our attitude towards events attitude towards people attitude towards things makes up our life and if our attitude changes and we realize that these are temporary things and come into our way just to create an experience for us our life changes right there so we don't have to wait for the next life to get the benefit of meditation we get it right here and now that's a very big thing that meditation can give you that experience of dying while living all these people have had experiences and their whole life changed from that point onwards when we feel that we know all these things it is probably that you have seen those things some people come to me and they say that we have an experience that we already seen death in our dream we died and we found we were flying into heaven or some other place how does that happen that is because this life is not the only life we have lived in human form and in other forms for millions of years for a long time when i say millions of years what about a soul that has just come first time into this body will it have lived millions of years yes because these lives we are li living now are just a show created it is a programmed show it is programmed like a dvd we play a dvd and this is like a dvd but in the dvd the rule of the game is that you cannot put an event there without a previous cause to that event therefore when we come for one life the very first life we carry with it the cause of that life which is a previous life which we never lived but it becomes our past for this human life that previous life becomes a past so when some people say i am going to see my past life they waste their time that they may have never lived that past life but the past life has been created so that they can live in the present life past life requires a cause also therefore there is another life behind, behind that if you keep on moving cause and effect there are millions of lives that we have had and millions of lives that we are going to have no matter what even if you come for one life this that's the basis of this physical life that it requires so many previous lives and creates so many future lives to think that we can do something good and great in this life to escape from it is a mistake when you do good things in this life it creates good rewards for you in the next life if you do bad things in this life it creates punishment for you in the next life it does not take you out of the cycle of lives coming again and again that only happens if you can leave the whole system in which these lives are created that real system can be left only when you are able to leave your mind behind because the mind is creating these lives in time and space mind is creating a life that has cause and effect our true home our true nature does not have any cause and effect it just is a state full of love beauty total knowledge and bliss that's what our true state is from there we have come to examine all these was it necessary some people have asked me if we were in a state of bliss already was it necessary to come down into a world of pain and suffering to come into a world that has pairs of opposites was it really necessary it was a necessary naturally then why did we come if it wasn't necessary why do we come and have an experience of this physical life the answer is very simple an answer that is applies to all consciousness that consciousness experiences 
deep experiences through pairs of opposites. If we have bliss in our true home and we see something that is not bliss, our own bliss becomes highly appreciated and different. By coming into a created world, we are improving our experience in our true world, in our true home. That is why this whole system has been created. This is a world of duality. That means pairs of opposites. Nothing is experienced here if there was no opposite. It's all pairs of opposites. For example, if this day is there, supposing it were day all the time and no night, you would never use the word day. You won't even know what is happening. You would completely ignore it. When night comes, day comes, morning comes. If there was no pain, there would be no pleasure. If there was no unhappiness, there would be no happiness. All these experiences we are having in the three worlds, not only this physical world, in the three worlds, they are based upon pairs of opposites. And therefore, our true home has no opposite. That is why to enhance the experience of a true home, we go into a world of opposites, a world of duality, which makes it a opposite of the world of non-duality. That means even when there is no duality at all in a true home, we can create a duality by creating a world of duality, which we have done. It's a very great scheme, the most wonderful scheme of creation that we can create an experience which can only come through duality. We can create that experience in a world of no duality at all. That this non-dual experience can be made into a dual experience by artificially, through consciousness, creating a world of duality, which becomes the opposite of the world of non-duality. It's a wonderful way. It is so perfect. These people who program these computer programs, I have talked to some of them, that if this is a way you can create experience of duality within none exists, can you find a better programming? No, they can't. This is almost perfect. It's, it is perfect. I am saying almost because we are sitting here. Otherwise, I wouldn't even use the word almost. This world of the mind, these are three worlds of the mind. The mind creates its own world of past, present and future and creates a timeline and places events on them. The combination of events the mind can create are infinite. And therefore, he can store those combinations in a memory bank in the causal plane. Causal plane is where everything is being caused, which we can experience here. Nothing is being caused beyond that. What we experience here is being created in the causal plane of the mind. The mind generates several types, random generation of several permutation combination of events, cause and effect, cause and effect. And those are stored there in some, some people call them Akashic records or Akashic records. Those records only mean the storing of the, of different combinations of destinies and lives which the mind has conned up there. They can all be seen by us just by going there, just by withdrawing our attention from the physical world and withdrawing our attention from the imaginary or, sen or astral world, we can move on into the pure mental world. What will we see there? All possible types of destinies that can be created are there already and stored. It is one destiny from there we picked up to be here. We did not hesitate at all to pick up a destiny which has so much pain and suffering here. Because the whole idea of picking up that destiny was to find a way in how to appreciate our true home better. And the soul was not involved in any of those patterns. Our true nature is consciousness, which is the soul. We call it soul. We distinguish the soul from the mind because the mind creates all those things. Soul does not. Soul empowers it makes it alive. Soul is the source of life. To make something living, to make something active as living thing, soul empowers things. Consciousness empowers, that means what is created can be experienced by us. 
we can become aware of it <coughs> excuse me if we understand the true nature of our self that our self is pure consciousness consciousness has an ability to be conscious or aware of anything it can generate a consciousness of anything without limit that soul soul becomes conscious of something that become creation it's not that it has to create something to do it just become conscious and it's not thought it is more than that it can create million and trillion of worlds any moment that's the power of consciousness and that's our soul soul can make something that's created into something that can be experienced by us by becoming aware of it conscious of it the power of the soul is to become conscious of anything that becomes creation therefore all that has been seen by us here and at every other level of experience is a function of the consciousness of the soul it just become conscious and it looks like it will be created that means there is nothing real in terms of a solid thing outside it's an experience that looks very solid that looks like it is subject to all the laws of determining if it is real or not how does that come about how does the mind achieve that it creates something just by its imagination if the word is not correct but anyway by imagining something it becomes real for it how does it test its reality it tests the reality of what is created in the causal plane by putting it into the astral plane what is the astral plane astral plane is not a place where we go to astral plane is to make that awareness into five senses that we separate seeing touching tasting hearing separate what we call our sense perceptions are the astral plane are the astral self there is nothing happening somewhere else. there is not a world like this the fact that we can experience things divided into different senses is the astral plane when consciousness makes use of the mind to create events it puts those events into sense perceptions for the same consciousness in the astral plane so we can hear something touch something they become different before that they were the same they were just supposing i am holding a book a story book the story is all in the book at one go not that i will be read, reading the story then it is being written story is all written in the book i am holding the book the whole story is there nothing new is going to happen whatever is this story is beginning middle and end is already in my hand but i haven't read it i open it start reading when i start reading it becomes subject to time it becomes subject to which page i am on that i am now on this page i don't know what's going to happen that's the future the future is also in my hand but what is printed there in the book is already in my hand but i wonder what will happen in the future why am i wondering don't i know that the book is in my hand the whole future is already written up there no i haven't read it i haven't gone to that part our life is created in the causal plane like a completed completely written up book everything written at once when we put it to astral plane we start opening the pages to differentiate which is i can see this i can hear this and then to make it more real we put on a material world and we get a material body made a physical matter when that happens it makes the story even more interesting because now the story is certain we throw the book away and we say let's see if it is all real yes is this is this cup of water real yes how do you know i can touch it how do you know i can see it how do you know i can taste it all real is it really real 
The story is real. I had a glass of cup in uh, in my hand, a water a glass of water, and I sipped it and I tasted it. Very good. Was the glass really there, or just in the story book? Let me give an example. I go to sleep tonight, and I have a dream. In the dream also, I see these flowers, beautiful flowers. I see the table. I see the cup of water there. Pick it up and taste it. Tastes exactly like you just tasted now. Taste is not different. The solid solidity of the glass was the same. I did the same thing in the dream. I touched it. It was real. I saw it. It was real. I drank water. It was real. The whole experience was real. And I wake up. The experience was real, but not the glass. The experience was real, but not the water. But what did I do? Because the experience was real. I forgot about the real experience and thought the glass and the water were real. I transferred my experience into something like an objective reality outside of myself. When I woke up, I discovered that only my experience was real, not the glass, not the water. They were created by my experience. This is true at all levels of experience. This is true right now. We are right now experiencing reality and we check the reality. I can touch it. I can see it. We are using the same five senses in order to determine what is real. And when we wake up, the experience is real, but not what we thought was real because of the sense perceptions. This is true here. This was true in the dream. It will be true at every level. When will we find out? When did I find out? In the dream, I could not find out. Somebody told me in the dream, you know, your glass is not real. You're just thinking it's real because you're having an experience of drinking water from the glass. Touch it again. I touched it again. It was real. I said, you touch it. My friend came. He touched it. Absolutely real. Both of us are experiencing. Let's call 10 more people. We call 10 more people in the dream. They touch it. It's all real. And we wake up. Neither those people were there, nor the glass was there. Or the water was there. Experience of the glass, the water and the 10 people was real. It's important to remember the difference between experience and reality of that experience. Consciousness only creates experiences and then it builds into the experience a system by which you can test the reality of that experience within the experience itself. We did not test the experience of the, of the glass. By waking up, we tested by touching, tasting, smelling in the dream itself. Same thing we do here. Everything has become real here. This is more real, I think. <clears throat> we make our experiences real. In the Indian scriptures, a word has been used to describe what is outside. They call it Maya. Outside is all Maya. And the Purush, the reality in us, the being that creates, is inside. Outside is all Maya. Translation of the word Maya, look in the dictionary, illusion. Not, not a good translation. It's not illusion. Not a, it doesn't look like illusion. It's not a shadow on a screen that we are looking. We are looking at the three-dimensional, four-dimensional world outside. It's not that unreal. It's real. Then what's the secret behind it? How can we determine with certainty that what we are seeing outside is only an experience of seeing outside and there is no outside? The truth is there is no outside at all. The outside has been created at the causal plane by the mind. Outside is created when time and space are created. And that's a creation of the mind. When mind creates time and space, it places events on them. Otherwise, time and space won't exist. And this is very interesting. I was surprised that Einstein, a scientist, was able to say that space is created by matter. There's no undefined space going on. And he died. And people are still trying to explore what he said. He says only when you put matter 
convert energy into matter, space is created to accommodate that matter. And since so much matter has been created, that so much space has been created, and is it such a billions of light years away that we can now examine, it's all being created by the conversion of energy into matter. That matter needs space, not energy. That energy can be housed in a black hole. Energy can be housed in a, in a singularity which was there before the Big Bang took place. He said those things. When I read those things, I said he must have had some experience drawn from a higher level of awareness because he's telling the truth and nobody could understand him. There were 50 people in the conference where he first spoke. Then he expressed his general th theory of relativity. Only one man got up and said, I understand it. And then he sat down. He said, I could understand it. Now I've forgotten. Other 49 didn't even understand what he was saying. Because he was saying things which are actually true. But they are not physical things he was talking about. That we create space to accommodate events. Therefore, events are placed simultaneously with the creation of space and time. Events need space and time. And all we are living in now, in this physical world, astral world and causal world are nothing more than events created in space and time. That's our life. Yet, it's just an experience of consciousness that's created through the mind. Mind is first created and the mind then creates all these. Now, when I say mind is first created, I'm wrong. Because first is part of time. See, I can't say how creation took place. If I try to use any word, they'll be incorrect. I say in the beginning this happened. It cannot apply to reality. It can only apply to the mind. Whenever we try to use anything in terms of time and space, we are confined to our mind. It's all mental exercise. It's not spiritual. Spiritual exercise cannot be described. Some of the yogis in India who got some experiences, they were asked, tell us, what was the experience like? Explain it to us. And they use the word, nethi, nethi, not this, not this. We can only say it was not this, it was not this. We can't say what it was. Because when we try to say what it was, we immediately bring in three-dimensional space and time. That's a handicap we have. We cannot describe. Therefore, masters have coined up stories. Not true, but stories. Just to give us an inducement to find out who you are. They come so that we can go back to our true home. That's their only purpose of coming here. They have no other purpose. They have not come to set up a group. They have not come to set up a religion. They have not come to set up anything. They just come to take the souls that are ready to discover their reality back. It's just a game. It's a game by which these perfect living masters come and take us back home. So that is why when they speak about something beyond the mind, it has to be just a story. A story similar to the stories we can understand here. There was one Swami, said Shivdayal Singh, Swamiji, who founded the Radha Swami sect in Agra. And in his descriptions of the higher regions, he said there are tall trees there, miles long trees all laden with diamonds, rubies, and jewelry. A lot of his audience was women, you know. That is why he used that good story about diamonds and rubies. So there is no space there for having trees. There is no space for anything. There is no space, period. So you can't describe it. Our mind cannot think, which is its main function. Cannot think, cannot conceptualize, cannot feel, Cannot do anything, cannot imagine something that is not in time and space. You can try as hard as you like. You can try to figure out something with your mind. If I were to say, I saw a big house, how big was it? Zero. When did you see it? In zero time. Makes no sense to us. And it may be true. In fact, it is true. That there are everything created, the whole universe that we see here is created zero time, zero space. But we can't understand it even. Only our understanding with our mind is limited to what is in time and space. It's a very big handicap we have. Because we try to do everything with our mind. We have become dependent on 
thinking and our mind. We become totally dependent. So dependent, we are almost like the slaves of our own minds. Our minds think and tell us what to do and we do those things. We are slaves of the mind. Was that the intention of creation? Probably yes, because that is how we are experiencing all this. But can we reverse it to make better use? Yes, we can. We can now use the same mind, which has been created by consciousness, by having the ability to be conscious of the mind and then using the mind the way our consciousness wants. I sometimes call that use of the mind as development of our spiritual will. If we don't develop spiritual will, we are always using mental will. All the time we say, let me do this, I am going to do this, I am determined to do this. It's all mind. It's all mental will speaking. Mental will trying to do things. Spiritual will is that which can say no to the mind. Which can direct the mind to do something different than the mind is going to do. And that is still coming from your own consciousness to develop a spiritual will. To develop a spiritual will is very easy. Just say no to the mind. When the mind is particularly keen to do something, is so attracted, tempted to do something, and normally you will do it. Say, no, not this time. Do it two or three times a week. Not every day. Because every day you use the mind in this normal way, which is part of living. Keep on living as you are living two or three times in a week. When the mind really likes to do something, say no. Mind will say, this time only. Say no. Mind will say, forget it. Once only, no. If you can keep up your no, your spiritual will develops. And mind which is making us a slave becomes our slave. You can see this difference. Just experience. If This is called controlling the mind. You can't stop the mind from doing what it is doing. Mind is essentially doing thinking. Just like the heart of our body, physical body, is what is doing pumping blood. Heartbeat is the life of the heart and makes it the life of this body. It has to pump all the time. It can't say, let me have a rest tonight and I'll dump tomorrow. So therefore, nor do we tell the heart. It's autonomous function. We don't say, now beat. We never say that. It's autonomous function of the heart, autonomous function of all these things, autonomous function of the mind to think. You can't stop it. Mind will think no matter what. If you say, I don't want to think, it will think of not thinking. It will keep on talking. The mind uses words and images. Mind uses the language you normally speak. Your thoughts are the same language. Sometimes it will come up with bizarre sounds and you may say, I might have heard somewhere, I didn't understand. But it's using language and pictures, images. You remember somebody, that picture comes in front. The mind makes up images. Words and images that the mind creates all take time. You can never have an experience with the mind which is timeless. No way. And since the mind is always thinking, and I remember, I told, share with some of you, some of you, an experience I had with a colleague of mine in Cambridge, Massachusetts, when I was at Harvard University. There was a colleague of mine studying also there. And we were both discussing the spiritual subjects every day. Whenever we met, one day he called me. He said, I have found the way to stop thinking. And I have always said, you can never stop thinking. So there was a challenge to me. So I said, do you know how you do it? He said, yes, it's just a question of positioning yourself in a tight lotus position and then holding the mind where it is and then stop thinking for as long as you like. I said, wonderful, I'd like to learn it myself. So I invited him to my apartment and I said, let's see what happens to a human being when he's not thinking. It'll be a great exercise. 
it will be great enhancement to my knowledge. I have never known this. Even till today, I can tell you, I haven't known what happens to a human being if he's really not thinking at all. So he got into tight lotus position and he closed his eyes. I said, do you, how long can you stop thinking? He said, maybe 20 minutes, half an hour. I said, if you can stop thinking for one minute, I will feel you can stop at any time, forever. Just let's test for one minute only. And one minute will determine that you get into your shape for stop thinking. I'll give a clap like this. When you hear the clap, stop thinking. After one, I'll watch my watch. 60 seconds later, I will give you a second clap. You can start thinking. Then we will sit and examine what happened to your consciousness when you're not thinking. Must be something strange. Let's see. So he got into that position. I gave a clap and I looked at my watch. 60 seconds later, I gave a second clap and he was happy to come out and talk to me. I said, did you stop thinking for those 60 seconds? He said, yes. I said, when I gave the first clock, clap, how did you know that was the time to stop thinking? I said, just recall, because we are going to examine what happened in those 60 seconds. What happened after I gave a clap like this and that you knew is a signal for stopping thinking? He recalled, yes, I did at that time after hearing the clock, clock say, now is the time to stop thinking. I said, that looks like a thought to me. He said, it's only two or three seconds. Let's cut the experience down to 57 seconds now. I said, after you said this to yourself, how did you know that when I give the second clap, you will start thinking again? I said, don't make a conjecture. Don't try to philosophize. Remember what actually happened. And he said, I actually remember after I said, now the time is to stop thinking. And when he claps again, I can start thinking again. I said, that looks like a thought to me also. I said, after that, what happened? Did you wait for the clap, second clap? How did you wait for it? He said, I remember I was tense at that time. In tension, in tension I said, in state, I said, I will now wait till I hear the second clock. Another thought. We had a conversation for about 10 minutes and he held his hands up. He said, oh my God, I thought more in these 60 seconds than ever before. Yet he did not know that he was thinking. So he said, how did it happen? How has it happened that I thought I was not thinking? And yet you have made me recall all the words that I actually used in thinking. I said, don't you know why it happened? He said, no. I said, I'll explain it to you what happened. Our mind does not only think in one channel, in one level. It thinks in several levels. You stop thinking in one level. And the mind was contemplating upon that thinking. You stopped that words. A finer language was going on in your head. Commenting, which you just remembered now. People say, when we do our meditation, we make the mind say our mantra. And the mind repeats the mantra. But when the mind is repeating the mantra, the mind is also thinking of other things. Sometimes it is commenting upon the mantra itself. You are going too fast, you are going too slow. Which is that mind? If the main mind is repeating certain words which you have induced into it, which is that mind which is also making a comment upon it? The mind functions in several layers of thoughts. So when you think you have stopped one layer, second layer opens up. When you think you have employed the mind in repetition of your mantra or simran, the mind can still be thinking and take you away. That's exactly what happens. People are doing their repetition and suddenly they find that they have been thinking of something else. Not from that point. Right from the moment they started doing simran or repetition of mantra. Because the mind can think in several levels. If you quieten the mind in one level, the second one opens up, third one opens up, fifth one opens up. I had the privilege 
to host His Holiness the Rai Lama from Tibet when he came. I was the collector deputy commissioner of Kangra district in Dharamsala. So this government decided to put him there. So he became a good friend and we would go, I had a nice Land Rover given to me by my government and we used to go and discuss things. He first learned how to speak English at that time or Hindi and English both. So we would discuss meditation because he realized that he had two senior gurus with him, two teachers who trained him in meditation and they came with him when he came from Tibet and they were teaching him how to do meditation and he realized that he could not hold to the Buddhist mantra, which he repeated. I repeated with him, Om Mani Padme Hon, Om Mani Padme Hon. The mind is still thinking something else. He saw it, made two voices combine to avoid mind going out. Now the mind is saying the same words, two voices. Third voice opened up. Fourth, I have noticed, I met many yogis with whom I have experimented this very thing about thinking and they can find very finer and finer voice of the mind up to fifth, fifth level. The Rai Lama could go up to eighth level. And I realized that how much he's been going inwards to discover how the mind works. So the mind never stops thinking. It will die if it stops thinking. If the mind dies, the astral self and the body also die. Therefore, it's like the heartbeat of the mind, the thinking. So the mind, since it's always thinking, it's the creative power of the mind is expressed in thoughts. So therefore, what we think at different levels in the mind is what is created outside. Mind is totally programmed in the causal plane when we come here. I sometimes give the simple simile that you pick up your DVD when you come from there. All destinies of one life, human life, are written up in the form of DVDs, pre-programmed. We come and we play the DVD in which there are many actors. All the people we meet are part of that show, part of the actors, including one actor who you think is yourself, who is not yourself. You are the one playing the DVD. Yet you place yourself in that DVD in one of the actors. Any actor, it doesn't matter. The DVD plays and you find you are amongst those people. And you begin to think that is you and the others are others. It is not true. The truth is you are watching the DVD and what you think is yourself, your body is just like anybody else whom you see in the show. That's not you. You happen to sit in that one character. That's so important because people say, can we with our own thoughts create something? I said, you can, not the thing that's sitting in the body and you think that's yourself. People say, we can't change a simple thing. If we made everything, why can't we change it? Because you're not trying to change the one from where it was made. You're trying to change from one actor in the show in whom you are sitting. The show becomes very interesting if you sit in one actor. Otherwise, it will be on a stage. Supposing we are watching from the sky somewhere and we see this show. It's not as interesting. If we can come down close to the actor, very good. But if we can get into one of the actors, most effective show, it becomes real for us. That is how we are actually operating. Soul has taken up a mind to create time and space. Using the time and space of mind, it picked up one section of the of a programmed destiny we call the DVD. It's playing the DVD through astral plane, separating the experiences of touching, tasting, smelling. And then it puts on a human body, sits inside that human body. The soul is sitting inside the human body and creating all others from there. And yet it thinks that the human body is different from the others. It's not. That's where we make a mistake. When we say, where are you? You can say, I am in my head. 
but you have no head. You are a soul. You are consciousness. Why did you say you are in your head? Why did you say you are in the third eye center? Because you have no third eye center. You have no head. You have no physical body. It's created around you. Where are you? I don't know where I am. Would you like to find out? Sure. Then go to where you are inside the actor where you think you are sitting. Not outside. Third eye center is just a part of the play outside. It's not a reality anymore than anything else. It's equally unreal. Not that you are more real, others are less real. What is observing from inside, what is experiencing from inside is real. The experience is not real. The experience is real. The experience is generating is in terms of its own experiencing that is a personal experience, but not the things that you are making up, including your own body. We get caught up in this thing. I am trying to highlight this fact that when we say God is inside us, is it inside the body? Then how many gods are there? We are seeing so many of us here. Are they gods broken up into pieces and is sitting inside us? Of course not. God is whole. Let me go back to the experience of a dream again, once again. We go into a dream. We see 20 people there. We meet them and we discuss. We are having a conference and we discuss that are we real or not? Most people say we are real. We can see, we can touch, taste, smell. We can do. We are all real. Some clever guy says we are not really real. We are experiencing something inside. God is inside us. Then the question comes up in the dream. In whom is the God? Is God in all 20 of us? Or in one of us? Which one of us? And we are silent because we can't determine in which of us the God is. And then we wake up. There was only one dreamer. 19 were parts of the dream. Can you realize even now there's only one dreamer? Everybody else that we see is part of the dream. Who is that one dreamer? Who is having the experience? Who are the others around us? Experience, part of the experience, not experiencer. Can you imagine that at all times in your life, no matter where you are, whether in a dream state or wakeful state or higher enlightened state or ultimately in your true home, there's only one person experiencing, one being experiencing, never two. Even right now it's one experience. When you experience something, only you are experiencing, nobody else. But it looks like everybody is experiencing the same thing because the show has been set up in such a way. This beauty of this creation has been achieved by situating us, the experiencer of the beauty, inside one of the characters. I tell the story from that book, jo Geoffrey Chaucer's book, Canterbury Tales. In Canterbury Tales, Chaucer writes that we were 40, 50 people going to Canterbury for a pilgrimage. And since there was no aeroplanes or cars in those days, they were either walking or going on horseback, somewhere in carriages. But they were telling stories to each other, singing songs to each other to while away the time while they were journeying, having the journey to Canterbury. In that group, Chaucer says, I was also there. He written that in the book. He was also there along with the others. Everybody tells nice poetry. That book is, by the way, a very important book in the history of English literature. And that book is the first one where a true novel has been st started. We read so many novels today. There were no novels before that. They were just stories. Once upon a time, there was a king. There was a queen. Never there was once upon a time very generous king. Very jealous queen. Those words came afterwards. Because Chaucer puts these qualities in its characters. There were people, an attorney for example, a lawyer was there, traveling with them. And Chaucer describes him 
a busier man than him there nors nors we never was a busier man than him there never was and yet he seemed busier than he was looks like a modern attorney he put characterization and that makes the book very valuable but the most valuable lesson one can get from the book is the chaucer also is part of the group he is a character in the book in the middle of the story other characters tell chaucer chaucer you are a great poet great writer come on you give us some nice poem and he says i don't know any poem as the author he knows everything he written as a character he knows nothing and then they insist on him no please come up with something we know you are a good poet and he comes up with the most ridiculous doggerel rhyme in the whole book and everybody criticizes him we did expect that from you why did chaucer the author of the book who could have become a king in the book become one who was ridiculed by his own creation is almost they compare this book the experience of chaucer in their book with jesus christ who was one with his father the creator and comes and is and is crucified by his own creation how did that happen if he was god himself one with god how did ordinary people created by god crucify him chaucer the author of the book who wrote the characters of all these people and all the poems in the book he wrote how could he be ridiculed by his own creation the answer is very simple the chaucer was not only the chaucer the character in the book he was all of them because he wrote all of them god is not one being or one person he's all of us completely that's the answer that the author the ex- the creator is one in all and all of them exist while the book is being read the drama is being enacted drama finishes there's only one that is how our spiritual path is the spiritual path that we follow through meditation through the most important factor that takes us beyond the mind which is an experience of love and devotion when the experience of love and devotion takes place we can rise beyond the mind because love and devotion do not come from the mind they come from the soul very simple if we understand even basically the limitation of the mind that the mind can only think mind can only function in time and space it does not function beyond that and that we have to be it is all an arrangement made by us if we are the origin of everything and we will be the end of everything the whole arrangement is our own and it did not matter how painful or, or life of suffering we have taken here because it's only one character in which you put that we happen to be sitting in that character some of you might have had nightmares at night in a dream i have sometimes had very horrible dream and it looks so bad when you wake up thank god it was a dream and the whole experience disappears do you know when we wake up finally from this dream we say thank god it was a dream there was really no suffering there was really nothing we just created to create a get better appreciation of the bliss in which we are enjoying thank you very much for joining me and we'll break for lunch and i'll come back again and see you for a little while and enjoy the lunch thank you